In this chapter, we're going to talk about how to set up your shader to do diffuse lighting. And uh, before we get into the code, I wanted to, uh, to show you an example here to, to illustrate what diffuse lighting is. You'll, you'll remember from the previous chapter that I mentioned that diffuse lighting is, is lighting that comes in from the light source and gets scattered in every direction uh, uniformly. So it's different from specular lighting because specular lighting is kind of a more focused uh, reflection direction that the light is, is bouncing in, whereas diffuse lighting, um, the light's getting scattered everywhere. So let me show you the theory behind diffuse lighting here. What I've got is uh, the surface of my model, and I've got two arrows here. The red one represents the surface normal, or the direction that the surface is facing, and the green one represents the light vector, or a, uh, a line coming from the light in toward um, the surface. And what you'll see is, as the angle between the light vector and the surface normal gets larger, the surface uh, gets darker and darker. So when I have a 90 degree angle or greater um, between my surface and my light vector, I've got a dark surface. Um, but when that angle is small, I've got a bright surface. So in order to calculate the diffuse lighting, what I need to do is in my shader, I need to measure the angle between the surface normal and the light vector. And then depending on that angle, um, I'll know what the brightness of my surface needs to be. All right, so let's jump over and I'll show you how to set that up in the code. So what we need first is a surface normal and a light vector. All right, so here I've got the, the shader that we finished up with in our previous chapter. So I've got the ambient lighting working. And you'll notice here I've got my ambient light set to kind of a dark blue color. And now we're going to jump into this portion of the shader. So as I said, we need our light vector and we need our surface normal. And we know how to get our surface normal because we talked about that in chapter one when we discussed normal mapping. So what we're doing with that is we read the color from our normal map and then we bring in our normal binormal and tangent from our vertex shader and then we convert the color in our normal map uh, from tangent space to world space. And what we end up with is our normal vector. So we've got our normal vector in world space here, and that means we need to have our light vector in world space also. In order to do math between two vectors, um, you need to have them both in the same space. So for example, if you had your light vector in world space, but your normal vector in tangent space, if you tried to do multiplication or subtraction or addition between those two vectors, the math wouldn't turn out right. It, it just wouldn't go. So you need to be sure that you have all of your vectors in a common space uh, before you start doing math on them. So let's come up here and take a look at our vertex shader and see what we've got going on. So here we have out.light vector, and that's here's our uh, output pr fragment program, and we have the light vector. So out.light vector equals light position minus world space position. So here we're calculating the world space position of our model, and then we're subtracting that from our light position. And subtracting these two positions will give us a vector from one position to the other. That's how you create a vector or a line between two points. You subtract one position uh, from the other position. So if I have my light's position in world space, and I have my object surface position in world space, and I subtract one from the other, what I end up with is the world space light vector, which here I'm passing out. And then in the fragment program, I bring that in, in dot light vector, and I normalize it to give me L. So now I have my normal vector, and I have my light vector. Now you'll notice that I'm normalizing both my normal vector and also uh, my light vector. It's really important that both of these vectors are normalized. And what normalization does is it takes the vector, when however long it is, it shrinks it so that it's unit length, so that it, it's, a, it's a, a length of one. And in order to do 
uh, t in order to measure the angle between these two vectors, they both need to have a length of 1 uh, so that the math will come out right. So there's two things that you need to do to your vectors uh, to make sure that you get correct math. Number one is that they're both in the same space, whether that be world space or tangent space or object space or camera space, just as long as they're in the same space. And the second thing that you need to do is you need to make sure that they're both unit length or that they're both normalized. So once you have your normalized normal and your normalized light vector, you can start doing your math. So let's come in here and uh, do our code. So I'm going to type float diffuse light equals dot. And dot is an intrinsic function, which basically measures the angle between two, two vectors. Um, an intrinsic function means it's a function built into HLSL. Um, so I don't have to create a function. Um, it just is there already. So I can say dot, and then I can pass the function the normal and the light vector. And so I'm passing in my light vector and my normal and taking the dot product of those two vectors. And that's going to give me the angle. Now my result is going to be somewhere in between 0 and 1. Uh, it's going to be 1 if the angle is really small. And it's going to be 0 uh, if the angle is 90 degrees or more. Now one other thing that I need to do is it's possible for this dot product to go above 1 or below 0. And I want to prevent that. So what I'm going to do is pass the result of this function into the saturate function. And you'll notice it's turning blue. When it, when it turns blue like that, it's telling me, ah, I recognize this term as an intrinsic function. And that way you can tell you know, if you spelled it right and if you got the right term. Um, to call that intrinsic function. So I'm going to say saturate the result of my dot product between my normal and my light vector. And the saturate function, like I said, it's going to prevent it from going higher than 1 or lower than 0, which is what I want. All right, so there's my diffuse light. And now I need to take that value and, whoops, you know what? I've been doing this in the wrong spot. I'm just going to go ahead and undo all of this really quick. And we're actually going to put it right here. I'm going to say float diffuse light equals saturate the dot product of the normal and the light vector. And end it with the semicolon. All right. And then we're going to say float for diffuse equals, obviously, our diffuse light. And we're going to multiply our diffuse light by our diffuse color. Now, if I come over here to max, I can bring up my material panel. And you'll see I have this value called diffuse color, which right now is set to white. And if I come up here to the top of the shader, Here's the bit of code at the top of the shader that's creating uh, that UI element. And here's the variable name, diffuse color. So I multiply um, that diffuse light. Diffuse light's only a float, so it's just going to be a value between 0 and 1. And I need to multiply that value by my diffuse color, which is basically the color of the surface. And then I also need to multiply that by the diffuse texture. So I'm using the diffuse texture here in the ambient, and I can just copy it and paste it down here. So now, instead of my diffuse being 0, 0, 0, like it used to be, I'm actually measuring the angle between the normal uh, and the light vector. And then I'm using that to multiply by my diffuse texture and my diffuse color. All right, so let's save it and see what we get over here in Max. Max refreshes, and now I've got my teapot actually responding to the position of my light source. So if I move my light source around, you can see that my diffuse light is working. Um, it looks pretty cool.
Now, one other thing I wanted to show you is how I'm bringing in the uh, the light position value here. Up here at the top of the shader, I've got this chunk of code here, which brings in the light position and also the light color. So this chunk of code here um, is bringing in from Max um, the world space position of the light source and also uh, the color of the light. Now if I wanted to actually use this light color here, so we'll jump down here to our technique and what I wanted to show you is for my vertex shader I'm passing in the position of the light and for my pixel shader I'm passing in the color of the light. So here's my light color that I'm bringing into my pixel shader. And if I want to actually use that, I can also multiply my diffuse by the color of the light source. And we'll save it, and it'll update. And you'll notice now it looks a little bit more orange um, because my light source is actually tinted orange. So if I bring up my, um, my modify panel here, I can come in and change my light color. And you can see that it updates for me nicely in real time as I change the color of my light source. So that's how diffuse lighting works. Um, basically, we're measuring the angle between the surface normal and uh, the light vector. And you can see with my normal map, um, the parts of the cobblestones that are pointing away from the normal, uh, are, or away from the light source, rather, are being lit darkly, whereas the parts of the cobblestones that are pointing directly at the light are bright. And that's being achieved by measuring this angle here uh, with the dot product. So now I've got a teapot that is being illuminated by ambient and is also being illuminated by diffuse, and basically the light's coming from the light source and being scattered in all directions. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about specular. We're going to talk about making objects look shiny and talk about figuring out how to kind of focus the reflection of the light instead of scattering in all directions, scattering it, you know, kind of reflecting it in a more specific direction. So we'll talk about that in the next chapter on specular lighting.